Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here for the kickoff of the fall um, CTSI Research Boot Camp, which was really put together and designed by Dr. Lori Tiki. So um, today the topic is an introduction to writing a systemic review. And she'll continue, um, it's, it's um, a little bit more frequent than what our typical monthly schedule is, so just be aware of that and don't miss any. So it's gonna be a great, great series. Let me just give you a little background for those of you who do not know Dr. Tiki. She's an associate professor of nursing in the Department of Adult Health here at West Virginia University School of Nursing and a clinical associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine. Um, she's an alumni of the Robert Wood Johnson Nurse Faculty Scholars Program, an American Nurses Foundation Scholar, and a graduate of the WVU Teaching Scholars Program. Her research program is centers on loneliness as a biopsychosocial stressor that negatively impacts physical and behavioral human health. Currently, the CTSI is, ha well, we have funded her for a project for the feasibility of her listen intervention for loneliness and stroke patients. She's married the mother of 13 children, and the owner of two small businesses in West Virginia. And I will turn it over to Dr. Tiki. Can you all hear me? Okay, well, welcome, everybody. I see lots of familiar faces. So um, those of you that know me know one of my favorite things to do is uh, write a systematic review. Um, I teach it with all of our clinical doctoral students and PhD students, and so what we're going to do with this workshop is we're going to, I've tailored the slides to be applicable to the multiple disciplines in the Health Sciences Center. And today we're going to go into some basic information, but if you are, how many of you are actually writing a systematic review right now? I know I talked to some students in the hallway that are actively writing one. Okay. How many of you are thinking you might want to write one? Okay. Very good. Okay. This is a great time to be here then. Because today is the day we're going to talk about, plan, you know, at the end, we're, I'm going to give you a structure for planning your systematic review. Um, for those of you that are sort of already in the midst of it, you might have to go back and do a little bit of reworking. But still, this is, this is the best time to come is before you do the writing. Because we're going to, uh, I'm going to give you lots of information today. And then you actually would be able to go from today. Um, these are the objectives of the overall lecture series. So it will be four weeks today. Basically, I'm going to give you the nuts and bolts, understanding the process of writing a systematic review. I'm going to give you a lot of online resources, okay? Next time, two weeks from now, we're going to talk about how to get that clinical question down because the question will drive the structure of the paper. After that, we're going to nail down a search strategy, and then after that, we're going to talk about how you get this work accomplished in a reasonable amount of time. So one session will build on the next. We won't be redoing things in the next session. So try to just keep that in mind, too. We're going to try to walk you through the, the whole process. Okay. So for today, we're going to cover these things. I'm going to talk to you about what really is a systematic review. What is it? I'm also going to talk to you about why you want to write one, because you all really do want to write one. You want to write one. I'm going to give you a lot of good reasons to write one. You want to learn about the major types of systematic review learn how to write a protocol or a plan for your systematic review, and then we're going to talk about what the steps are in that systematic review process. Okay, it's a pretty detailed process just to let you all know ahead of time, and so you can anticipate, you know, six months. You know, if you're thinking about writing a systematic review, don't think you're going to write it in a month, you know, because that's just not realistic for most of us who are academics or students or scholars. You know, let's plan this out and we'll do a writing schedule. Okay, so we all read different types of literature reviews. Okay, so the important thing for today is to know what we're talking about when we talk about a systematic review. Um, you know, when we read articles, the beginning of those articles, you read a mini review, right? Usually the beginning of a research report or research article has three to five paragraphs that talk to you about the significance of the problem and give you some background information. Technically, that's a mini literature review. That's not a systematic review. Okay, you'll see the same thing in um, proposals. If you're trying to get funding, you'll read the first page or two of a proposal will be background or significance information, giving the reader some idea of why you're studying what you're studying. That's a mini review, but that's not a systematic review. Okay. 
So when you're writing your dissertation, I know I've got some PhD students here today writing a dissertation, you're going to do an in-depth systematic review. That'll be a long review, usually 15 to 30 pages, really getting to know the topic and establishing your expertise on the topic. And then what we're talking about today will be a focused, comprehensive, systematic review. Usually we're aiming for about 20 pages in the, to get that published in a journal. Okay. So these are reviews that appraise and summarize bodies of research. I do want to say too, I know I've got some teaching assistant professors out here as well today. I don't know who's at the other campuses yet, uh, but I'll say hello to them. But, you know, it's possible to write a very rigorous systematic review related to really any facet of your faculty role. So, you know, if you're here because you want to write a systematic review about the best teaching method, of, that we can do that. You know, if you're going to write about results of some quantitative studies on a specific research problem, those are, you know, we will use the same process. So, still use the process of rigorous systematic review, even if you're researching what the best way is to teach something. Okay, or, or, you know, outcomes of service organizations. So whatever your passion is, I do encourage you to write a systematic review on something you're very passionate about because you're going to be deep in the literature. So that's, that will be key as well, figuring out what your question is and what your passion is. So I want to give you this basic information. You know, Co the Cochrane Collaboration is well known for um, amassing very rigorous systematic reviews. And so this is their definition of what is a systematic review. I'm hearing some sounds there. So it's a high-level summary, okay, high-level, high-level thinking here. It's a summary of primary research reports, okay, and you're going to try to select, identify, and synthesize the findings from all of the high-quality studies or evidence on the topic that you're studying. So your question drives the research, but you do, in a systematic review, it is the expectation that you're finding all of the evidence. Okay, all the evidence. Um, so we get a synthesis then from a systematic review from multiple studies. You can do quantitative, qualitative, or integrate both. So I don't know, is anyone here planning to write a systematic review of qualitative studies? That will be a little bit different. We may have to give you a little different format. Um, and then you're going to synthesize those results. Maybe large or small studies if they're done in a rigorous way so that we can draw some valid, reliable conclusions about the topic at hand. So whatever your topic is, we want to make sure that we're finding all those studies, looking at all those findings, so that we are logically inferring conclusions from the results of those studies. Right? We want to make those logical inferences. Okay. So we're going to address a clearly defined question, right? And the characteristics of a very rigorous systematic review, there's three top characteristics. They are transparent, they are objective, and they are replicable. So it should be that as you write your systematic review, when you talk in your paper and write about how you conducted the literature search, that should be replicable by a reviewer at the journal site or someone who's reading your paper. Okay, so we'll get, in, we'll get into that in some of these later sessions. You're going to follow some very orderly steps that you're going to carry out in a way that helps us to minimize bias in your inferences that you make about the study findings. And you're going to collapse this large amount of information so that readers can read about the studies that have been done on this topic and they can think about what they're learning in a manageable way. Right? They can then take what they're learning to um, either their clinical practice or policy or some other kind of area of teaching, area where they want to implement something. Um, I think an important thing to know about systematic reviews is when you do a very rigorous systematic review, it allows us maybe to broaden our generalizability or transferability of study findings because we're combining all these study findings. So we're not just looking at the findings from one study. Because you can imagine if you look at the finding from one study, those results may be biased and you may, you don't want to just take the findings from one study to clinical practice, certainly to patients, right? We have to look at all of the evidence. And so they also can give us some increased confidence and then lend a format um, for ongoing updates too. So if we follow a certain standard of writing. So what's not a systematic review, all those narratives I talked about? You know, initially, before you do your systematic review, we all get into the literature databases and do an exploration, right? And I think that's where a lot of people kind of get put off on doing a, a systematic review because how many of you have been overwhelmed by literature searching? Yeah. You know, you get in some of this literature and you're like, oh my gosh, how could I read every study on 
drugs and driving. I got someone about how could I read all the studies on um, depression? You know, how could I read all the studies on the best way to teach? I mean, you know, you can easily get overwhelmed. And so by following the steps I'm going to give you for systematic review, we'll take down that um, perception of being overwhelmed and hopefully get you into a very focused question where you'll be looking at relevant studies that answer your question without feeling like the, the body of literature is so big that you can't manage it in any kind of reasonable time, even with a team, you know, and, and get a nice paper out the door. So um, meta-analyses are not systematic reviews, um, and this conference and these four sessions are not about meta-analyses, so I just, I just want to say that up front. Um, meta-analyses are where you use pooled data, pooled statistical data from studies, they're very high-level high evidence, as are systematic reviews. Um, to form conclusions. And so, but there's no mandate when you do a meta-analysis that you have to include all the relevant studies. You know, and, and systematic review, you're really trying to get at all the results of all these relevant studies. So um, there are papers that have been published that are both systematic reviews and meta-analyses, but just being clear on that, a systematic review is not the same, not a meta-analysis. Okay. So why should you write a systematic review? Well, for, for me, the first and foremost reason you should write a systematic review is because you want to know something. You're a scholar, a student, professor, teacher. Um, your in, intrinsic motivation and passion for a topic is the first reason you should write the systematic review, because you want to be the expert on the topic. Because it's a lot of work. It's really a lot of work. So um, if you're going to write a very rigorous systematic review, you know, certainly make sure that what you're writing about is something that you have a lot of passion for. It's a topic that you really want to study and you really want to develop some expertise. Okay? The other reason you should write it is because we're, we use systematic reviews to inform our clinical practice and that's how we build evidence. And it was um, in the Evidence Summit 2017, this was my favorite tweet actually from the Global Evidence Summit this year, which was data is not evidence. Evidence is when we have data that has then been synthesized and put into a protocol, and then the protocol has been tested, and then that's really evidence for clinical practice. So uh, some of the reasons that we need these systematic reviews is so that we can have consensus on findings from multiple studies, so that can inform clinical practice guidelines, so we can do some either comparative effectiveness or implementation studies so that we can know what's best for our patients and patient care. You do the same thing or best diagnostic test or you know, best treatment, whatever it is you're studying. So um, they give us good concluding statements and the key point to remember here is that you know, systematic reviews are, they follow the same principle, garbage in, garbage out. You know, the quality of the review is only as good as the quality of the studies you include in the review. So um, if you're going to write a systematic review, we'll talk about that, I think it's in week three, uh, we want to be careful or be sure that the studies you're including in your review, you've set your inclusion and exclusion criteria so that you're including studies that have been completed in a rigorous way. Okay. So systematic reviews are at the pinnacle of that evidence hierarchy. Okay. Um, they're also, if you're trying to make an impact on your discipline, if you're a faculty member or a student and you want to be a faculty member and you're looking to publish your work and have your work cited and show impact, systematic reviews are some of the most highly cited papers because it's often easier for someone to read your review and cite it than it is to go and conduct your own review. So, you know, they tend to be cited more often than some other papers. Okay. So these are the types of systematic reviews. I tend to divide them up into quantitative, qualitative, integrative, or economic, but there's also some reviews done on policy and teaching, so I don't want to leave those out. Um, and quantitative reviews are really an integrative review or a, a literature synthesis of findings if you're not doing a meditative, a, a meta-analysis. Qualitative reviews are where you're summarizing findings, but you can't really do any statistical analysis there. Okay, so I'm going to say a couple things about qualitative reviews just so, um, and then I'm not going to say much more about those because I think they're very interesting to do, especially if you have an interesting phenomenon that you're studying, but in the realm of qualitative researchers, there's a little bit of a conflict about whether or not, about how much value 
they have because qualitative studies are generally about the lived experience or um, theory development and so um, synthesizing findings from qualitative studies can be really difficult because they're usually small sample studies that are really unique to a certain population, maybe ethnographic or um, unique to a very specific population and their experience of a very specific phenomenon. So um, I think if you're sort of globally trying to understand a broad phenomenon, you could do uh, conceptually, you could do a qualitative review, but overall, um, it, you're probably better served to do a, a review of quantitative studies if you're on a topic that you have enough randomized trials to do that. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some of the information I want to give you about models and tools. Um, if you're gonna write a paper really, not, not even just a review, but a, a good scientific paper, you could consider going to the Equator site. The Equator site is a site where there are links to guidelines for all types of research reporting. And so it's a great uh, resource for faculty and students and it will give you guidelines for different types of paper, papers that you might, it just sort of pulls together all the different types of papers that scientists might be wanting to write. And so on the Equator site right now, there are links to the Moose Group, the Prisma Standards, and then the Joanna Briggs Institute has some um, a, a data extraction tool for qualitative studies as well. So I think go to the Equator site and check, and I'm gonna go into detail about some of these other um, tools that you might want to use. So the Equator group, this was an international initiative um, and the aim of this group was to improve the reliability and value of published health research. So that was a broad aim of this group and to promote transparency and accurate reporting. So the group that developed Equator were researchers, journal editors, peer reviewers, funding agencies, and their mission is really to maintain a collection of online resources for health research reporting. So I think that should be your first go-to site. There are links there to all these different guidelines that you might use for different um, types of papers that you want to write. So this is one guideline. I don't know if anybody is interested in writing a review of you know, observational studies in epidemiology, but if you're writing that specific kind of review, you want to use this Moose guideline, okay? Um, it was developed in the year 2000 by a panel of experts and it really is almost like a checklist for what you should report in this type of review. The checklist was published in JAMA and I put the link on the slide too for the publication from JAMA. So if you're writing this type of review, um, definitely check out this checklist uh, in JAMA. Does anybody have any questions or anything right now? I'm just gonna keep going, there's a lot of information. Okay, the main focus I think of this group will probably be these PRISMA guidelines. So PRISMA is the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses, but if you're just writing a systematic review, it's still, it's a list of the prefer preferred reporting items, things you should include in your systematic review. It was released in 2009. There's now an update from 2015. If you're deciding to do a meta-analysis, there's an explanation and update that's also been published but the sole aim of PRISMA was to really enhance the quality of systematic reviews um, and to really have consistency in the reporting, you know, how we report items in systematic reviews so they would sort of be on um, more of on an equal playing field there. So the PRISMA guidelines are now, since 2009, it's been about seven years, you know, journals are now, you should start to see this if you've been, have, have any of you been seeking a journal for your systematic review? And when you start to look for a journal of where you might want to submit your systematic review, um, you'll probably see in those author guidelines recommendations that you adhere to the PRISMA guidelines. Okay, so that's just a heads up there. Like, it, it, go ahead and write your systematic review using the PRISMA guidelines because many, many reputable or high impact journals are now including this in their author guidelines. Okay, okay. so PRISMA is also, oddly enough, a 27 item checklist and it's almost like following a recipe. I, I, I kind of, I really like the PRISMA checklist because it tells you how to structure your paper, tells you what to include in each section of your paper and you know, if you follow that guideline and stay on a time schedule, 
you will come out with a, a pretty nice systematic review. There's also a flow diagram. I have some examples here for you. So this is an example of a flow diagram from Prisma. And basically, this is how you would disclose. In session three of this workshop is going to be about literature searching. But this is how you would disclose what articles you decided to include and what articles you decided to exclude and how you arrived at your final number of studies that are included in your paper. And if you're writing a paper using the PRISMA guidelines, you will need to attach a, this figure. It's readily available online in Word format. You can edit it and attach it in, as a figure to your paper. So you want to, <clears throat> if you're already starting to peruse the literature, um, that's fine. But once you get your search strategy down with your keywords and subject terms and things of that nature, um, you'll want to track that very carefully, how you, the decisions you made in your literature searching and how you decided to include or exclude articles so that you can develop this figure and then that makes your search replicable to people that read your paper. Okay, so just start thinking about that now as you are just doing, really in the first two weeks of this semester, really of this workshop, you should really just be perusing the literature, thinking about a topic and also um, writing your protocol for your paper, your plan for your paper. So but this is something that you'll want to include. Okay, the next thing you need to decide on is who's going to write your review. Who is writing the paper? How many of you are planning to write in isolation? Nobody? Anybody writing by themselves? Systematic review by yourself. You know, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. It might not be the good thing. If you want to go far, get yourself a team. So. These are the common people who are involved in the writing of a systematic review. Somebody that knows the content, somebody that uh, knows the methods, right? Maybe a st statistics expert who can help you interpret the findings of those quantitative studies that are included in your review. Um, the medical librarian, we're going to talk about that more on the week we talk about searching. And then um, a reference management system. Are you all using, re how many people use a reference management system? Good. What are you using? Uh-huh, Mendeley. What are you all using? Okay. Okay, I use EndNote, but I mean, it is absolutely essential to use a reference managing system. So it's very hard to write and be a highly productive writer without using a reference management system. My favorite is EndNote, but the library has Mendeley and other resources that are available, very inexpensive, that work pretty well. And so um, it, that's important to be familiar with the reference managing system. and. That's something I would do in these first two weeks, too, as you think about planning your systematic review, is make some decisions. You know, who's going to be on your team? It's going to be part of your protocol for your paper anyway. And then, you know, what reference managing system are you going to use and watch some tutorials? Because anything you can do to get that work out of the way early will be helpful as you start to work on your review paper. You won't have to worry about that. You already have mastered that knowledge. So sometimes I want to go fast, though, and then I go by myself. But you have to have the time to dedicate to it. So just have to make those decisions up front and live with your decisions, you know. Okay. So this is the basic process of writing a systematic review. It's very, very much like just doing a research project, right? You're going to formulate and refine your questions. You're going to devise a search strategy. You're going to retrieve your potential articles for inclusion. You're going to read all those abstracts. Um, you're going to make decisions about inclusion, exclusion, and track all of that. Then you're going to critique that literature that's included in a rigorous way using a critique tool, okay, which we'll get into those two in a different session. And then um, when you're abstracting, you're encoding the information from your studies. And then you're going to synthesize it and write your paper. So that's the overall process of systematic review. So it's very cookie cutter and recipe like if you follow it, you know, do a schedule and follow it. It's not, um, the process isn't as difficult as the decisions you have to make to do the process in my view. Because in order to engage in the process, you have to make some clear cut decisions about what you want to study, what you need to know, who's going to help you, those kinds of things. So and just like any paper, I'm going to give you a more defined structure for um, organizing your review. But you know, plain and simple, you need an outline. You need a protocol for your systematic review. 
you need your main topics in there, you need the structure of the review um, in a logical way, you're going to use the PRISMA guidelines for developing the protocol. PRISMA has two sets of guidelines. They have one to write your paper and they have one to write your plan for your paper. Okay, so I left the article back here today. This article that's on the back table includes the PRISMA guidelines for writing the plan for your paper. I did not bring the actual PRISMA guidelines because we'll be doing that later. Okay, so the first couple weeks, let's work on the plan for the paper. And then um, we'll talk, if you're doing a qualitative review, let me know. So first step is to write your plan, right? And that is in this handout. And that is a checklist that was published in 2015. And that, again, is aiming to facilitate um, rigorous but consistent reporting of systematic reviews. So I don't think you can see this, but this is what is to be included in your systematic review protocol. Okay, so there's a lot of questions to be answered here. First is, um, you're going to say it is a systematic review, and the very first thing you notice is pick your authors. Okay, so pick your authors, co-authors. Think about who you need on your team. That will go into this plan. So you're going to answer these 17 questions, hopefully before our next session in two weeks, so you know what your plan is for your systematic review. Uh, and then we can move forward with really refining that question. So that'll require maybe meeting with some potential co-authors and really hashing that out, thinking about um, how you're going to do it. Does it, anyone have funding to do the systematic review? A lot of time and funding. You can go a little bit quicker if you do, you know, if you've got some funding and you're buying out some of your time to develop a systematic review paper, then you can maybe go a little bit faster. Um, and then what your methods will be. And we'll be, we'll be getting some more talks on that in the next, um, the next few sessions about the best way to refine a topic. Is anyone, is anybody struggling with even having a topic or does anyone have a refined topic that I can answer any questions on or? Once you have your plan for your review and you know exactly what you're going to do, um, then you want to register you want to register your systematic review, and it sounds unusual, but Prospero is where you go and you register prospectively that you're going to write a review. So plus it's a really good time to write your plan for your review, and then go and register in Prospero that you're writing this review. You want to do that for a couple reasons. One is it increases the transparency of your paper, and two, it also, um, Prospero is an international organization that's trying to limit, du eliminate duplication of reviews, and people overworking, so you want to look in Prospero when you're thinking about doing your review and see if anyone else is writing the same review. Maybe you don't want to write that one then. It'd be a little harder to get it published, so you have to think about that too. So I would go to Prospero and register um, that I'm planning to do the review. So you have to have your protocol finished before that. These organizations are all linked. So Prisma and Prospero are linked, and so the fields in Prospero are similar to the fields you have on the protocol uh, when you're developing your plan for your systematic review. So, so that is a general overview of what is a systematic review, why you should write one, and how to write a plan for one. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions you might have that would help you move from today to next week when we meet in two weeks with your clinical question. So do you have any questions about the process or how much time it would take or anything like that about um, how much time you should be allotting for this in your calendar? Remember we have previously I did a talk on writing productivity and I think I might have added that in here. Right here, if you're going to write the review, you've got to make a commitment. Um, you've got to make sure you have the commitment to do the review and then the time to do the review. So that's another thing you can do early on is block your calendar out with, you know, 30 to 60 minutes a day where you're planning to work on this review paper where you won't get distracted so that you can actually accomplish the work and get it finished because it's, it's a good bit of work. All right, and then um, remember to ask for help if you get stuck. These are our upcoming sessions, and this is the plan for the upcoming sessions. Like, if, if you all wanted to, I mean, I, I, I can move on or I can just um, 
stop here and let you think about the information you have and how much time it will take to write the protocol. Um, but when you're writing your plan, check in weekly and adapt your plan as needed to make sure you're not, you know, you don't want to go guns blazing at it and not uh, leave time to take care of yourself when you're writing these kinds of papers because they're pretty intense. So, um, is there anyone have any questions at all about the process of writing the systematic review or the protocol planning to write your systematic review? So, how do you feel about it? Tina Antle, I see your face right there. How do you feel about it? Huh? You get buried in the literature. So the key to not getting buried in the literature is um, having a well-defined clinical question at the beginning. Okay. So once you have this well-defined question, you are going to set your inclusion exclusion criteria so that you can, you, you want to, the, pay, the purpose of the paper will be to answer your question. It's, it's not with, with all the available evidence, but you know, you, your question is limited by the population that you're studying, by the specific variables that you're studying or specific phenomenon that you're studying so that you're not um, completely buried in the literature. So it isn't unusual though to, you could anticipate reading 200 abstracts. I mean, that's, that's not, to me, that's doable because you're, if you have 200 potential quantitative studies that could be included in a systematic review, then um, an abstract takes maybe five, 10 minutes to read and decide if it's a study that meets your inclusion, exclusion criteria for your review. And so you just have to go at it little bits, little, you know, 30, 40 minutes at a time to get that work done. But most systematic reviews will be manageable. Um, there's a new book that says in a year, you know, but I like to think six to nine months you could have a nice paper if you have that commitment and time to do it.